Welcome to the Superintendent's Hangout, where we discuss topics in education, charter schools, life in general, and not necessarily in that order. I'm your host, Dr. Sharetta. Come on in and hang out. In this episode, I was privileged and honored to sit down with Felicia Rangel Samponaro, virtually via Zoom. Felicia is one of the founders of the Sidewalk School, which is an NGO, a a non-governmental organization, focusing on providing education to asylum-seeking families and children at the U.S.-Mexico border. In this wide-ranging interview and conversation, Felicia and I spoke about curricular design, the decision to have teachers who are qualified teachers and also asylum seekers themselves teach the students at the sidewalk school the role of racism and the challenges that Felicia and others have faced in that regard, the role of government policies, government action or government inaction as the case may be, the federal government, the U.S. government's app that all asylum seekers are mandated to use to make their appointments and the challenges, the systemic challenges and obstacles that are inherent within that app, and much, much more. I hope that our listeners will check out the show notes, click on the links provided, consider donating to this wonderful and transformative NGO. I also hope that you enjoy this episode and will spread the word. Welcome, Felicia. Thank you for coming in and hanging out with us for a little bit today and um, sharing your story. Oh, thank you for having me. I was wondering if you could start there with uh, your origin story. History matters, uh, and I think it'd be important for our listeners to understand where your path comes from and what's led you to the present moment and and anything you'd like to share about uh, your work and sidewalk school and, and anything else. I guess, uh, so we could start with, uh, I used to be a housewife for nine years before I started this work. I do have a child. And this work caught my interest because I do live on the border. Mexico is across the street from where I live. And down here on our news networks, what was happening during Trump's administration was constantly running on our TVs in this area. Um, And it started out with metering and it was really hard to see children and families living on a bridge with no food, no water, and had no idea when they would be able to cross. They were just kept, kept on a bridge under a carport. And that was really hard for me to see as a mom and as just a person. And so I started crossing uh, with other groups of people, other volunteers. We didn't know each other. We found each other on Facebook. (laughs) Um, And we started crossing and delivering dinner and blankets and coffee and water to these families. At that time, it was maybe 25 people, believe it or not, because as you know, today it's thousands. Mm -hmm. people that live in encampments but at that time it was like 25 or less that lived there um that's how I started personally how I met the other director of the sidewalk school Victor Cavazos was he was one of the people in that group that I found on Facebook Mm. was volunteering his time at the time uh, he is also a father but he also worked for a company IT he wasn't doing anything close to this And it just struck his heart as well. And he and I met on a bridge that night in Matamora serving asylum seekers. And then from there, as metering turned into migrant protection protocols, as people were stuck in Mexico for years, as we watched 25 people turn into almost 5,000 people, we decided to start the sidewalk school. That was back in 2019. But that's how the school started. What can you explain what metering is for for folks who may not know? Um, it is when you decide a certain number of people can cross into the U.S. every day. Mm. That is what metering is, and how it was worked out on the bridge. Uh, it was in Mexico. It was left up to Mexican officials 
to keep a list of people and decide how many got to go that day. There's a lot of corruption involved in that, as you can imagine, especially with no oversight from in either government, because this was all new for them as well under Trump's administration. Now, you know, they use CBP one app to meter every day. So it's different now. And we'll, in, in, a, in a minute, I want to, I'll get to, you know, I want to hear more about the specifics of the sidewalk school and kind of how it was built and what it looks like today. Uh, but Title 42, that's something that, uh, you know, I think the nation was hearing about depending on where folks get their news from. It was either going to cause uh, a run at the border. It was going to cause, it was going to solve all the problems when it went away. It wasn't going to solve all the problems when it, way, when it went away. Um, can you share how the the sunsetting of Title 42 impacted uh, the work you do in your life um, and how that looks in, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak? So let me say how we got there, and it's really short. You know, after Trump lost his the election and Biden won, people made the mistake of thinking that these encampments at the border, it was done, it was over. And all of the NGOs, including the sidewalk school, we got zero donations, zero funding. And little do, did people know, when the Matamoros encampment closed, the original one, because now there's a new one, but when the original Mad Morris encampment closed, a new encampment in Reynosa opened up. And at one point, those two encampments overlapped. As one was ending, the other one was just beginning. So the very last day of the Mad Morris encampment for Victor Cavazos and I, the next day we were in Reynosa watching a brand new encampment get formed. The Reynosa encampment held about 2,000 people. Under Biden's administration, he took away my migrant protection protocols, but in his place, put new laws and policies that also made it difficult for people to legally cross into the country. The Reynosa encampment was huge on a very small piece of land, nothing like the original Matamoros encampment that stretched miles. Mm. They were jamming thousands of people on top of each other. And this is during the pandemic. So at night you would hear just hundreds and thousands of people coughing, trying to breathe at night inside of the Reynosa encampment. Title 42 is something under Biden. And so I compare the two administrations. Um, I know a lot of immigration lawyers don't like to hear that, but I've seen it when no one crosses, like under Trump, People were dying inside of that encampment from cancer, from infections, from just tons of things. He would let them die there. Two under Biden, where under Title 42, he would give you an exception. If you were dying, he would let you come into the U.S. and get medical care so you can live, or your baby could live, or your toddler could live. So there are a lot of pros and cons to all of it. Um, but I've told many people I would vote for Biden again over a Republican president because I've seen what they do. And something's better than nothing. So when these camp encampments come together, you, you just described a big geographic area and a camp kind of being shut down and then morphing into another one. These are... Uh, kind of being created almost organically, correct? They're not really directed by any authority in Mexico. There's just people who are desperate and they're moving to another spot, correct? That is correct. All of these encampments, the original Reynosa encampment was taken down one night. And when they took down the original encampment, they thought, oh, it's over. Now we have our property back here in Mexico. What happened was it created five new encampments. Mm. Ran from one to five. No one thought about that. When you displace thousands of people and there are no shelters or shelter space, where do you expect people to go? So groups of people went into five different places. And then we have five brand new encampments in Reynosa, 
which made our work harder because then we had to drive around to all of the encampments. But yes, all of this is organic. There are no international organizations that come in that's to set guidelines to provide safety, security. We don't have any of that in our region. When I say our region, I mean Matamoros and Reynosa. These campments are wide open for anyone just to come in and do whatever they like because international organizations refuse to step in and, and assist us. So you have little bitty NGOs like the Sidewalk School, which right. no one ever heard of, ever. And I don't expect you to ever hear of us, <laughs> but you have a little bitty NGO that started out solely as a school. And we used to literally teach on the sidewalk into we built a shelter. Our shelter is called Kaleo, it's in Reynosa. It's meant for children and their families. We have a clinic now in Reynosa. We have a clinic in Matamoros. We have a building in Matamoros. We have morphed into this big thing that we never thought we would be. And we've had to learn all of these new skills just to help thousands of people every day because there are not a lot of NGOs doing the work that we do and national, international NGOs refuse to come into our cities to help us because they say it's too dangerous. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, about the danger, the perception of danger? I, you know, I, I saw YouTube videos where you, where you talked about how dangerous uh, Reynosa is and can you, what does that look like on a daily basis? And, and why might it be dissuading other uh, aid organizations and support organizations from wanting to work there? Let me say, whenever I hear these international organizations who refuse to come to Mexico because of the danger, yet they go into Ukraine or other war zones, I would like Americans to think about that. If this international organization is brave enough to go into a war zone, but is too scared to go into Mexico, uh, into border towns, yet we're okay with leaving thousands of people in these border towns, what does that mean? <laughs> what? So it's not safe for any American to go to. Actually, we're not supposed to be going. It's on like red alert, I think, for us Americans. That's how dangerous Mexico is. But it's okay for us to leave thousands of families, babies, and kids out there to wait for a CBP-1 appointment. It makes no sense. Somehow our U.S. government figured out within three to six months to how, how to let in thousands of Ukrainians into the United States legally and orderly. That's their favorite word, an orderly fashion. We somehow figured it out for this one nationality of people, but we couldn't figure this out for Haitians. We couldn't figure this out for Hondurans. The sidewalk school, this is our, our fifth year and our US government still hasn't figured it out for minorities but we have figured it out for Ukrainians. It lets me know that there is a solution because they already came up with one <laughs> for the Ukrainians. So now if they could just move it on down <laughs> to people of other nationalities in other countries, then my job will be gone. My job will be irrelevant. And, and hopefully one day it will be. I, I don't want to always spend my life working in U.S. made encampments. So you have you, you've described a situation where it grew from a very organic school on the sidewalk, literally, to now uh, shelters and clinics, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit about how the the school portion works. As I understand it, your teachers are uh, are asylum seekers themselves. Um, largely, uh, all supported by donations. So later on, we'll talk about how folks can support your your great work. Um, how do you how do you conceive of and nourish a school with such a high level of transience, right? Because I'd imagine that both these children and the adults are constantly in flux. Talk to us about that. So that is that is very true. Um, race does have a lot to deal with this. There are no white asylum seekers in any of these encampments. And almost the five years I've worked now in, I've worked in 11 encampments now in my region, no white people. Mm. All of these asylum seekers are brown and black people. 
And that's something else Americans need to know. <laughs> so your next question should be, why are there no white asylum seekers? And that's because they're getting into our country and they don't have an issue the same way minorities have the issue. Minorities are stuck in Mexico for years uh, compared to white asylum seekers. But back to school. The sidewalk school, one of the main reasons we started was because a lot of our volunteers are white. And what was happening, what I was seeing, what Victor was seeing, whenever the little kids who are all minorities were seeing a white person come, they would all get like really happy and excited and like, oh, you've come to save me. And they would literally use those words. Mm -hmm. And that's very hurtful. Um, and so we did only hire asylum seekers and it was asylum seekers living in their community and their camps with them. The teachers all had degrees. They were all had training. They were all professionals. And so, because it was important for the kids to also get excited when they see brown and black people coming. Yeah. That's really important for kids to see that. And also they need to see their teachers as leaders and they need to see their teachers giving out donations to the other people in their community, not just a white face doing that. Right. So the sidewalk school started, that was one of actually the main reasons we started <laughs> because I wanted the kids to be excited when they saw a brown face too. But also it gave, so the teachers, they don't work for free. And it's not sustainable to expect people to live off a donation for years, especially under MPP. That lasted two years. We watched the kids grow up during that time. Um, and so the teachers were getting paid. So they no longer had to wait for anyone to come and give them anything. They were able to, to then move to apartments to yeah. eat. They were able to go out. We were just trying to, to give back in a community where we are the the foreigners in. And that's something else I don't think people think about. We're, we are the guests in this country and we are the guests in these communities. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Victor and I should not be in the forefront telling people what to do and how this goes. No, you need to put the people in the community in the forefront and let them lead and tell me and Victor, this is how it goes. <laughs> and right. then we could talk about it because I was a, a registered teacher in the state of Texas. I, I have a degree in psychology. So it was one thing that the kids were trying to come to the US and I wanted to give them a taste of US education as they lived in the encampment. But it's another thing coming from within their own community and what they're used to seeing and hearing and doing. It had to be a mixture of both for the kids to actually learn something from it. So, it, it's a balance that we play for years now. It, it's actually one of the things that really caught my attention because it's one thing that we wrestle with. For example, in my role in California, I wrestle with that all the time is to try to have teachers and staff who uh, look like and come from the backgrounds of students. Uh, schools all over America, that's not the case. Um, the profile of of uh, teachers, as you know, is socioeconomically often very different from their students and and racially and ethnically and linguistically. And I could go down the whole list. And so if you do, I think that that was something that was very uh, really struck me about the design that you have is um, whether it was somewhat by kind of default or by design or kind of a, a natural way that a community would support each, itself. Uh, to have teachers uh, who who better to to teach kids than someone who's educated and trained and you know uh, I was very inspired listening to um, I think he's uh, I'm going to forget the name but a Cuban uh, Cuban um, uh, teacher uh, who was right. in one of the yeah in one of the YouTube videos and I was like this is awesome you know and he's talking about the needs of the kids and and so like he gets where they came from. And that, to me, that was a very, very beautiful piece. Yeah, yeah, Ray is actually still one of my really, really good friends. We talked yesterday. <laughs> but Ray, Rodney, yes, that's the original uh, Sidewalk School staff, actually. This is the other thing. I've spoken to an American school 
that has taken in children asylum seekers after they've crossed into the U.S. and started in a public school. And she was telling me how the teachers have all these issues, but these are American teachers. Yeah. So, right. So if you're getting someone from their community to teach them, they understand what happened to them in these encampments. And I'm not saying run out and hire someone who <laughs> used to live in an encampment, but you could. We had tons of teachers that lived in that camp. We have teachers now that live in the Madam Morris encampment. They are qualified, they're trained, they can do it. And it would be more helpful to the student um, because there is so much damage being done to them on a daily basis that what an American would consider to be troublesome or acting out or something, it's really not. That's not what's going on at all. Like in the sidewalk school, Madam Morris, we have a calm corner. We have a calm corner, we have a feeling stick, and we have a feeling tree. And all of those are used all the time because the children do need to take breaks and they do need to get out what is happening to them inside that encampment. If you can imagine about three or 4,000 people living in an RV park, mm. all in tents with no bathrooms, no food, no water, just like jammed together, surrounded by dirt. A lot of things happen to these children and to the adults. It happens, if you live in a camp, things are happening to you, just a promise. So when you put them in a school environment, especially a US school, and you expect them to sit there for eight hours and take in all this information you're trying to give them, I'm gonna tell you that's not gonna happen, especially if they just cross. It's not. Not unless you're also providing some therapy, some emotional support, a counselor, because this child needs to get out a lot of stuff. So when this American school contacted me, it was the principal. She was actually just asking me what I thought was going on. And I told her what I'm telling you. They need emotional support. They're not going to do great their first year. They need to get past so many things. Also, when they're in these encampments, Mexico isn't providing school to them. The U.S. government is not providing school to them. The sidewalk school is who's providing school to them. And I can't force them to come every day. So sometimes I see them, sometimes I don't. So in this time, from the time they left their home country and finally made it into the U.S. and finally sat down in your classroom, they were probably out of school for about a year, maybe more. And you're expecting them to do these things. And as American teachers, we're not taught about this, much less I like I'm not being asked to speak at different schools about my experience running a school in these encampments. No one asked me to do that. I would love to. I think teachers should know, especially if you work in a school where these children are coming to, you need to know what's happening to them. That, that would seem like a fairly sensible thing for a principal in Texas to do, right? send you a message and say, hey, can you come to, I don't know, whatever city, can you come and talk to my teachers and at a you know staff meeting or can you make a video? And like, to me, that doesn't seem like a bridge too far, right? But as you mentioned previous, it's just a matter of, is this a priority for 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 folks or not? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the, in the US. Uh, you, were, you were talking about the Mexican government and the US government and how you know, kind of neither one is providing school uh, and and perhaps other services. Um, what what is your relationship? What is the sidewalk school's relationship to government entities? Um, uh, I guess on both sides of the border in terms of the of the work you're doing. So people have asked, what does NGO stand for? So we're a non governmental organization. <laughs> um, with that being said, we try not to get caught up in the politics, which is impossible thing to do. Um, right. But even in interviews such as this one, I don't ever say if I'm left or if I'm right, mm -hmm. because we get donations from both sides, believe it or not. People all over the world, regardless of their political party, care what's happening to people out in these encampments. Um, but we do try our best to stay out of the politics game. How, apart from the politics piece, is there a, I guess what I'm wondering is how do you interact with local authorities on both sides? Or is it kind of like people are, I believe that humans are genuinely 
uh, inherently fairly nice uh, and are like, hey, someone's helping young kids. And whether the system hasn't figured out a way to help kids uh, as individuals, I think it's a pretty universal sentiment that that young children need support. So maybe, hey, there's this there's this uh, former Texas housewife who's like leading this charge with other staff members. And we're just going to have, you know, hey, there you go. Has that kind of been the sentiment? When it comes to children, yes, both sides of the border are usually kind about that aspect of it. Um, under Biden, under Trump, there was no leeway. He gave no leeway to anyone. Hmm. Under Biden, he does give some leeway when it comes to children. Uh, the Mexican government also, I mean, overall, when it comes to the school aspect, we are treated very kindly on both sides. Because they they don't want kids out there starving or right. dying, or, you know they don't want that. And we do provide education, but most importantly, we provide food. We give them breakfast, we give them lunch. We always fill up the water tanks in the school, so they always have access to clean water. We have a shower on our second floor. Like we provide basic necessities as us Americans would view it. To them, it's a luxury that we're providing. So both sides of the government understand what we do in both cities. And when it comes to that, yes, they're kind about it. What do you think are the biggest misperceptions of the work you do? And the, the I, I should say misperceptions that the public might have about the work you do and what these children and families, you know, who they are as humans, right? I mean, I think there's been rhetoric uh, for the past years about undesirable people coming to the U.S. and this, and so um, talk to us about your experiences with with families and what should the public really know about uh, the the families you serve. The biggest misconception is an invasion at the border, and because if that was true, we wouldn't have all of these encampments in both cities. So we have these encampments because people are waiting to legally cross. Um, the other huge misconception or something I don't know if people actually think about is people aren't just leaving their home country just to come to the U.S. just because it's like the cool thing to do. People are leaving behind their families, their moms, their dads, their friends, their house, their childhood homes. That's a hard thing for anyone to do. And you do that when you are scared for your life. That's when you do that. So I don't know, it's just something, it always surprises me when people don't think about that. Like you don't take your child and travel halfway across the world on foot with a backpack and that's all you got just because I wanna go to a different country. No sane thinking person would do that, much less thousands upon thousands of people. People do that because they're running for their lives. Uh, the the New York Times just I think it was today had a article on the the Darien gap the Darien. Between, yeah right. right right and I'm sure a lot of the families who you work with have have certainly if they came from South America they came through there um, yeah. and if they're from African nations etc they very likely might have landed in South America and come through and I just was astounded like when you really focus on the volume of people coming through there that it's just turned into as you say like big encampments and there's a closet there's a cottage industry of people who drive the boats and there's people who sell the packaged food to people and there's a people who you know sell rent tents and it's massive and so as you say though that those are probably the precursors i'd imagine of eventually of the families that that reach the the northern stretches of mexico and and end up in reynosa for example yes yeah, a lot of our families come through the Darien Gap. And as you know, a lot of people die in the yeah. Darien. It is a very dangerous place, even though it has more foot traffic now. People often drown in the river. Uh, we come across families where one parent survived and the other parent didn't. And luckily they saved the, the child or the children. But they watched the other parent drown in the Darien Gap. Those are common stories for families. 
are they drowned uh, in the Rio Grande River? Like we hear all types of things from these families um, as the parent, the surviving parent is trying to move on. And as the child is really confused about what is happening, how we got here, where is my other parent? We've seen all of it. And we try to provide normalcy and comfort through school to these children who are who are going to have to process all of this. And then they end up in an American school where sometimes the American teachers don't know how to handle that situation because the American teachers probably don't know, like, this is what all this child had to go through. And now they're sitting here. And now I'm asking them to learn something from me. So it's it's a lot. I wish the system was definitely different. And I wish American schools did have something for children asylum seekers because they definitely need something uh, to help them in school. So they can be successful in the end because that's always the goal to make them successful. Have you have you had to become an expert in the, the, uh, the, the CBP um, one app? Um, I know I know that like from our neck of the woods here in San Diego, Tijuana region, lots of news stories about the the app not working or being delayed or and people kind of desperately trying to log on. How has that been uh, where you, with you working with the families? So, yes, the sidewalk school, we did have to become experts at the CBP one app. We were the tech support in our region, Madam Morris and Reynosa. Uh, the sidewalk school staff used to go out into the encampments. I used to send them out in groups to help the families use the app. We also provide internet in Matamors and Reynosa because that's something else people don't think about. We are requiring thousands of people to use the app, but yet we do not offer free internet. Internet along the border in our region is sketchy. It is not a solid connection. The sidewalk school bought two Starlinks we put one up in our shelter in Reynosa. We put another one up in a shelter in Madam Morris and gave out the password to everybody. Wow. We pay for that every single month because people need to have a fair shot at getting this appointment in the CBP one app. We have asked both governments to pay for the internet in our region because I mean, as you've already heard, we run a clinic, a school, a shelter, and now we're paying for internet. <laughs> like we, we don't get a lot of money. We don't at all. Um, both sides of the government said no, that they would not pay for it. So we are one of the organizations, uh, I believe two more organizations are now paying for internet in both cities, but we were the first ones just to come out and pay for it outright because we saw people who could not afford internet could never get an appointment. Also, if you didn't have a newer version of a smartphone, you can't get an appointment. Um, I mean, we saw so many issues with that. And then in the beginning, if you were my skin color, I am brown or black, your picture was not being accepted. We saw so many issues with this app and it continues to have a lot of issues, even as we speak today, even with all the updates to it. You mean that? I Sorry to sorry to interrupt you. I just for clarification. So even just the uploading of the photo, it wasn't the system wasn't accepting it. No. Um, and if anyone ever gets bored, you can go back on my Twitter account, the Sidewalk School, uh, okay. because I was very vocal about the racism mm. in the beginning when the app was first released. It was meant for white asylum seekers and people of fair skin tones. It was mm. not meant for people like me or anyone darker than me. The app has, it's been an update, but once again, it's meant for people who have resources to afford these smartphones. And to be honest, in the beginning, it was meant for people who had iPhones. Right. And as an American, we think everyone has an iPhone, but iPhones are only popular in our country. <laughs> Other countries use Androids. So 90% of the asylum seekers coming to <laughs> our border all had these android phones but this app was meant for an iphone i mean it was it's one issue after the other 
with the app. Also, there's no map on it, which means we are expecting people who are not from Mexico to know the geography of Mexico and know where all of these ports are as you try to make an appointment. Me as an American that has the luxury of sitting here with time on my side, I don't know the geography of Mexico. So I don't know why someone from Haiti would know it. I don't know why someone from Guatemala would know it. But in that app, if you click in it today, there is no map. They just list ports. You pick it. If you get an appointment there, you then have to figure out where that port is. And then your next thought is, how will I get there? Yeah, I, I went on just kind of curiously looking on uh, on uh, social media and looking at comments about about the app. And I know even just using a similar interface with the federal government over even uh, something like a passport card or the century card that we have here, even that for someone who reads English and again, as you say, has time on my hands and has stable internet. Sometimes I'm just perplexed by how, do, how does this work? It has multiple layers of authentication. You need to get text messages passwords and then code words and i'm like this is strange for an entity that is being supported by by taxpayers so uh it, it's an interesting journey how do you where do you get your inspiration and your resilience because because um when you talk about you started off today by saying hey, i'm a former housewife uh and i i imagine <laughs> I'd imagine that uh, your life has changed in dramatic ways um, since you started, since you you saw the plight of of uh, people on the bridge during metering, and then that's what uh, four or five years ago, and then to the present. How like how do you keep going? People ask me that. I mean, there's different. I I have personal reasons for why I keep going. And then there, there is something about once you start doing this, and I guess at the level, so when we first started, let me also say I'm, we're the only minority or black NGO in this region. And along the border, there's only two. <laughs> it's me and Gerling Joseph, the Haitian Bridge Alliance. We're the only two black people that do this job. That's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> So let me say, starting out, no one was trying to give this Black woman money, right. and no one was trying to give Victor Cavazos, who is Indigenous, money either. Our colleagues are white, and I had to use my entire life savings the first year, two years, that it was all my own money, because no one was giving us anything. Right. I was fortunate enough to be in that position because I know a lot of people who look like me don't have, who can't be out of work for two years and not get paid, who had a, a you know, retirement fund. Yeah. Very fortunate for that. And I don't regret how I use my money. I would do it all again. But, <laughs> so on the American side, yeah. and, and now working on the Mexico side for a couple of years now, it is, it was hurtful, really hurtful to me in the beginning that racism, like it sits up front in this line of work. Like it sits um, right next to me. <laughs> on both sides, correct? On both sides on, of the border. On both sides of the border. Like racism is like right there staring at me every single day. And in the beginning, that was a really hard thing for me to push through and kind of push past because like we needed to do this thing over here. And then I so this is for our country oftentimes people don't know when race when especially if you're not a minority right when racism is happening or microaggressions or any of it they they are very unaware it's happening usually obviously I can recognize it I'm black so in this job it does sit in the forefront the racism. And I'm always surprised whenever people try to say, like, this is all asylum seekers. We don't want any asylum seeker in this country. 
But that's not true because when the Ukrainian war started, they let in thousand, like 20 or 30,000 over a month or two month span. It was not only were we letting in people from Ukraine into our country, we were also giving them work permits. We were allowing them to walk across our borders. Ukrainians used to walk past our encampments full of brown and black people and just cross into the US. It is very different depending on your race, how you're treated coming into our country. That is a hard thing to see and watch. Uh, I am black and I am Mexican. I am both. Right. So it's my people all the way around. <laughs> like all of them, every one of these camps are my people. Um, I don't know. I mean, we would have to, get, it's a long discussion just about working in this environment. The sidewalk school, like we didn't get funding for the longest time. We were often left out where as our colleagues would get hundreds and thousands of dollars and we wouldn't get one. And oftentimes, and even sometimes to this day, a reporter will ask me like, what makes me qualified? but you're not asking my white colleague over there who just finished high school, but runs an NGO, whereas I have a degree and I had a certification. It's just differences all the way around. I had another reporter ask me, why do I think black people don't come out to the border to help? She was white. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, black people can't go without getting paid <laughs> for like six months. Like our society doesn't build up that way for brown and black people. We don't have generational wealth where you can just go out to this border and and give your money away like that. If black and brown people had generational wealth, you would see more of them out here on the border. Of course they care about their people. Of course brown people care about their people, but we don't have that. There's a reason why you see majority white volunteers and most of the NGOs are ran by white people. Are, that talks a lot about the US. I often tell people like, we have gone for a long time about race. <laughs> race in this line of work. It's just the questions that have been asked to me over the years. It just, I don't know, it just kind of blows my mind sometimes. It just does. <laughs> how, how can, what's your greatest need right now? Uh, at the sidewalk school, um, you know, people listening to this, um, some of whom may know somewhat about the topic, but it's unlikely that they know a lot. So this has been great to kind of get a crash course. And I know this is just a tiny little dipstick, yeah. of like just a little experience, but how can people who who do have kind hearts and, and are, are, you know, looking to do something, how can they help? I would say first, don't try to come to the encampments. Right. I was going to um, ask you about that. So I'm glad you said that. Yes. Oftentimes we get people who want to come down here and it's not possible and it's not safe. Right. The main thing is it's not safe. Um, and it's not possible because there are not a lot of American NGOs, at least in the region I'm in, Matamoros and Reynosa. There are not a lot of us. And the very few of us that are on the ground, we are working constantly. So we can't have volunteers to show around or protect or like we, cause we don't, I don't have staff and I don't have money for that. Um, so, but if you want to donate money, that is always great because it's easier for us to buy things on the Mexico side because usually it's cheaper, especially food is cheaper on that side than it is the U.S. side. And when you do donate or let's say buy food on the U.S. side and send it to me, I'm going to take it. Thank you very much. But also know that we get taxed. They tax us once we cross into Mexico with it. We have to tell them how much it costs and then they tell us how much we have to pay them and then they let us go. Um, but we're always asking for school supplies. Uh, right now, the Matamoros encampment has over a thousand, under 2000 people, but it grows every single day. Um, 
all of the shelters in Matamoros are full. There is a new shelter uh, that the sidewalk school does support. That's where our Starlink is. It's actually inside of the new shelter. Uh, but please donate food to the new shelter. And then in Reynosa, if you'd like to donate to Kaleo, please do. That's the sidewalk school shelter as well. And we still have a school there as well. We have two schools in Reynosa. Um, so I'm school supplies, please donate to us. And if you don't want to donate to the sidewalk school, there are other American NGOs. I'm more than happy to direct you to them or to our Mexico partners. It does not have to be to us. And I, I noticed that you have a an Amazon wish list as well. Um, that's got school supplies on there, some food items. I think I saw yeah. tents. Uh, there's <laughs> tents on there, and it, should people just go and just select, kind of, you know, go through that list or any priorities? I mean, you said the books and the food. Um. Food is always a priority uh, and school supplies, we never have enough of. And I'll tell you what, uh, under Trump, when it was MPP, we watched those kids grow up. We spent two years with them. So, and at that time, the sidewalk school, they were progressing like from one grade to the next. We actually did report cards and progress reports during that time. It was under Biden's administration when it became more fluid and the students kept changing and the teachers kept changing. We still do have teachers who used to be asylum seekers that work for us to this day. But yes, our entire staff has changed. So the teachers who work for us today, they have now decided to seek asylum in Mexico. They no longer want to cross into the US. Um, and so the kids, because of the CBP1 app, sometimes I'll have you for two weeks, Sometimes I'll have you for eight months, right. but it is a steady flow of children. So our school, we, we give out stuff because of COVID. Uh, the pandemic really changed a lot of stuff. Like you couldn't check out books from us anymore. So now we have to give you <laughs> the book. <laughs> and so we're still kind of in that phase of we'll just give it to you so no one can get sick. <laughs> But so we're always in need of school supplies, like paint, finger paints, uh, construction paper. Believe it or not, construction paper is super expensive in Mexico, like mm -hmm. really, really expensive. So construction paper, scissors, uh, pencil sharpeners, those are the things that we are constantly out of, constantly. So if anyone would like to donate that to all of our schools or just one of the schools, that would be great. But if you just want to donate to our clinics, um, the sidewalk school clinics are actually ran by American doctors. Our clinics are virtual. So our doctors are able to get into these cities, whereas before they couldn't. But our nurses are nurses who are registered nurses in Mexico. Okay. They're physically in the clinics while the doctor is on the laptop. So and medications we give out are free because we know since you live in an encampment, you're not going to be able to afford the medication. So we give that out. Our clinics are the most expensive thing that we run. It's even more expensive than our shelter because the medications cost us so much. So if anyone would like to donate to our clinics, please, please do. <laughs> You'll be saving people's lives. I I'm thank you for that. I'm going to put for the listeners, I'll put the links uh, in the show notes so that with more information and the links to, to donate as well. So we can, uh, if, for people who are interested in, in, in helping um, what are your long-term goals for the sidewalk school? You know, you, before you answer that, one of the things that you said that really touched me was when you said that it was really important for you to have teachers who had had the same lived experience as the students, because then, uh, this wasn't kind of like a white savior coming to the camp, uh, and, so how like how does that fit into the long term goals for the sidewalk school? I, I mean, I would imagine you you'd like to see a time when you're not your work isn't necessary anymore, right? Because, but uh, we also have to be you know I mean I don't know when that time would will come <laughs> ever, right? So what what are the long term goals as you continue to grow um, uh, your organization? 
Um, so something that we never talk about, and we should, is that we have a school in Africa inside the Zaleka encampment, Malawi. We started that school a year ago, or a little over a year ago now. Hmm. The goal for the sidewalk school at one point before uh, the encampments continued in our region, Victor and I, we were going to take it to other countries and put it inside encampments where education was not easily accessible. Um, but once Reynosa encampment started, the original one, and as you know, it's continued on to many more encampments since we stayed, we didn't leave. And we let the sidewalk school, we partnered with another NGO called Rock. And Rock provides free university classes for people inside the Zilek encampment. And we told them, run it, <laughs> run it. You know, we'll help finance it because we care very deeply about it. That's why we started it. And we were like, once this ends, we're gonna come back to you and we're gonna go to Africa and we're gonna really invest our time in the sidewalk school, Zaleka. Well, as you know, a new Madame Morris encampment started late last year. <laughs> so this is our this is our eleventh encampment with the two cities. Um, and so I don't know when this is going to end. I don't. And another election's coming up. Um, depending on who wins is going to depend on what these encampments will look like after that election, whether or not they'll grow again to five or more encampments or back down to one encampment. I'm just surprised more, this is, I think our fifth year and most Americans aren't even aware that all of these encampments are like right across the street from these American cities. When in Madam, from Brownsville to Madam Morris, once you cross the bridge, look over to your left, there's a huge encampment in Reynosa, once you cross the Hidalgo Bridge, <laughs> look over to your right. And these these are U.S. made encampments because these are people who are trying to become U.S. citizens. So anyone who says this is not a U.S. made encampment is incorrect. These are U.S. encampments. I, you've been very generous with your with your time. I'd imagine your work schedule is uh, non traditional and uh, kind of never ending. Um, but my last question, let's say this is kind of a thought experiment. If you had the opportunity to create a billboard uh, for the side of the freeway um, that people drive by every day, maybe it's the international border that that um, has thousands and thousands of passengers back and forth walking and driving, whatever. What would your billboard say, or what would the sidewalk school's billboard say uh, about your work to the world? Let me tell you what I told Nickelodeon. <laughs> I guess we just did an interview with Nickelodeon, and they're way, and they're way cooler than me, so we'll go with that. <laughs> well, so because they asked, like, what would you tell children, and then they asked me, what would you tell an adult? Right. Right. And so for the adults, I told them I would tell the, the parents they need to vote. But before you vote, I want you to go and learn about the other countries where these asylum seekers are coming from. I want you to learn about Haiti and how it was devastated by an earthquake twice, yeah. how their president was assassinated in his home. I want you to learn about Honduras, how natural disaster devastated their country. What was that three or four years ago? And just leveled that place out. I believe if people knew what was happening in these other countries, they would be more understanding about why they're coming to the US. Also, I also believe that most people just don't know what is really happening in, in these other countries because then some of these comments that I hear wouldn't be said. Um, but after you learn about other countries, vote. I would tell the parents to vote. And then when it comes to children, when you see a new student at your school, maybe they don't speak English, say hi, ask them to sit with you, teach them English. It means a lot to these students when someone thinks about them. We do, we are partnered with the Butterfly Effect and that's an NGO ran by two young women. They're now 15, but I met them when they were 10 mm. and they have taught inside of the Reynosa and the Matamora schools. They still teach in one of our schools. 
uh, these young ladies now, uh, they send bracelets sometimes, but they teach the little, our students how to make butterflies and they take the butterflies and they exhibit them all over our country. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but you should look, it's pretty cool. Look at the butterfly but, effect. Yeah. But so the butterflies you're seeing, whenever our students finish them, I ship them to their mom here on the US side. So some of those butterflies were actually made inside of these encampments by our students. Whenever these kids see, their names are Lily and Kaya. They get so excited because they're like, oh, this American girl is thinking of me. And it's like, yeah, she's thinking of you. So if you see a new student, say hi, sit with them, teach them English if they wanna learn it. It just, I've, I've seen our students cry when Lily and Kaya like sent them friendship bracelets. Like they just, it just broke their heart, not broke it, but like it just touched them. But that's what I would tell a kid. The fact that we see all of this firsthand, is it's hurtful. It's hurtful. But the fact that Americans don't know about it is surprising. Because our government's the one doing it. Well, I really thank you, uh, Felicia, for, for your time and your candor and your passion and to the listeners, please check out the show notes and um, consider donating and and at the very least consider learning more and becoming educated, um, as Felicia says, about both for voting purposes, but also just for human purposes to know what's going on in, in the world. But thank you so much for, for your time today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Superintendent's Hangout. You can follow me on Twitter at DVS1970. Please be sure to share this show with friends and family on social media and in the real world. Thank you to Brad Bacchial for editing and production assistance and to Tina Royster for scheduling and logistics. Thanks for hanging out and have a great day.